Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is David Lyon. I'm a senior fellow for global R&D at Lanza Pharma and Biotech. Uh, the title of my talk today is five is, is a cytotine inhaled dry powder formulation profoundly improves pharmacokinetics and efficacy for lung cancer through gene gnome reprogramming. I'd like to acknowledge that this is a collaboration between Lovelace Biomedical and Lanza Pharma and Biotech at the Bend site, Bend, Oregon. Uh, this is a collaboration that's been ongoing for something over 15 years now. So for the work done today on 5 Aza cytidine, I'd like to acknowledge the Lovelace crew and the Lanza crew that are named um, on the slide here, uh, particularly Phil Kuhl, uh, Stephen Blinsky, and David Vodak. Um, this work was published originally in the British Journal of Cancer uh, earlier this year. Well, I had a pretty fancy title uh, going in. Really what this talk is about is local delivery for treating lung cancer. And this is really a treatment platform case study with spray dried 5 Aza um, as a dry powder. And as I go through this, this is of course a DDL Christmas lecture. We'd normally hold the meeting in Edinburgh. Um, so this is a little bit of a tribute to Edinburgh as, as I go through. Uh, hopefully you'll enjoy some of the treat photos that I will show of, of Edinburgh around Christmas time. I know we all miss Edinburgh, uh, particularly the 40 knot wind coming off the Firth, uh, the sun not rising until it uh, seems late in the morning and, and departing quite early in the day. Yeah, so uh, my last name is Lyon, and my uh, clan, clan Lyon, uh, comes from the area up around uh, Forfar, uh, north of Dundee in, in Scotland, uh, right off the Firth of Tay, and probably the fact that uh, uh, the golf courses at Carnoustie and St. Andrews are close by. Uh, uh, describes my addiction for the game. So here are the highlights and the outline for today's lecture. I'm going to start with the highlights. And so if you can't uh, stay awake and because you're either up late at night or early in the morning as I will be, and here they are. Uh, drug delivery to the lung directly enables, uh, uh, improves lung function, lung drug concentrations. Uh, dry powder formulation also achieved improved exposure in the lung, of course, the liver and brain tissues. And then finally, a dry powder formulation of 5 that reduces tumor burden in rats more than an aqueous aerosol or uh, IP injection. So the outline really will focus on the background of lung cancer therapy, uh, potential for local delivery, uh, 5 aza as a candidate for local delivery to tumors in the lung, uh, enabling technology approach, uh, in particular spray drying um, for inhalation. And then finally, 5 use of 5 A's as a PK in PK studies in rodents and an efficacy study in an orthotopic rat model. Um, finally, a, a little summary and, and takeaway points. So yeah, I'm changing gears now. So here's the Christmas market. Unfortunately, I closed this year due to the pandemic, but a beautiful site, uh, normal years. This will lead me into a discussion of, of lung cancer. Um, lung cancer is the leading cause of, of cancer-related mortality in the US and worldwide. 90% uh, of lung cancer appears to be non-small cell lung cancer. Um, Five-year survival rates really anemic, 5% uh, for advanced cases. And then targeted or immune, immune therapies have, have shown some promise in limited patient populations, um, but they're not widely used yet. Uh, and finally, Topatikan is a potent anti-cancer agent approved for various solid tumors, but really it's, its clinical use is undermined by severe hematological uh, toxicity. So for treatment, stage two and stage three A cancers are typically treated with uh, surgery and then followed by chemo or radiation. Uh, once you get to stage three and beyond where the uh, cancer is metastasized, gone to the lymph nodes, uh, gone other places, surgery alone is no longer an option. And so you fall back to chemo, radiation, uh, uh, again, immunotherapies or targeted therapies, again, remembering that uh, the overall mortality rate remains high for people that get to that stage of cancer. So mechanistically, and I'm an inorganic chemist, and so I have to think very simply about biology, but gene silencing by excessive DNA methylation really is the cause of lung cancer. And so as you can see from the graph in a normal cell, you will find your DNA lightly methylated and functioning just fine. Um, however, in a cancerous cell, overmethylation can occur. That again leads to gene silencing that then really leads to cancerous uh, activity. So 5 aza cytidine or 5 aza is a potent demethylation agent. And so the thought is, is if you can get 5 aza to the desired targets, 
you can demethylate the bad things that have been happening uh, to the DNA and, um, and then hopefully uh, reduce the cancer response. This is approved for a couple of different um, indications for cancer and it's administered subcutaneously for seven days per 28 day cycle. Uh, exposure of five days, however, in the lung is low when it's administered by either an IV, a sub Q or an oral route. And so, and it isn't useful and isn't uh, a line of therapy for any sort of lung cancer. So of course, what are the advantages of local therapy for lung cancer? Well, um, many lung cancer treatments are limited by toxicity. So uh, if you can deliver the drug directly to the tumor rather than going systemic, uh, you have some hope of, of getting uh, re reduction in tumor behavior that way. Uh, problem is, is most of these drugs have poor distribution to the tissues, and that's 5 as that falls into that category. So ideally, um, lung, local delivery to the lung can improve um, therapeutic index, uh, potentially is uh, viable for self-administration. Patients potentially could take the drug at home rather than having to go into the clinic for an infusion. Uh, and ideally, it's better patient compliance. So the key, though, to deliver directly to the lung is particle engineering, getting the right particle size. And as those of us in this community know, um, for proper inhalation, we really target the one to five micron uh, particle size MMAAD uh, characteristic to get to that deep lung and be able to uh, administer a therapeutic dose. So the torchlight procession, again, I'm pretty sure these people aren't socially distanced, so I'm guessing this is also uh, canceled this year. But it leads me into uh, particle engineering for inhalation delivery. And that's talked about on this next slide where we're looking at spray drying being an enabling technology. It's a fairly simple uh, concept where you have a feed solution, uh, ideally dissolving both the excipient and the API in a common volatile solvent. Uh, in the case of inhalation, because of the number of, of excipients that are available, that solvent's almost always water or, or solvent water mixtures. Um, it's then pumped into the spray dryer where it's contacted with a drying gas. And during that drying period, which is very short, um, particles form and you can see a representation in the lower right hand uh, section there. Of it's, it's an SEM of uh, some spray dried particles. Spray drying is suitable for a wide range of APIs, small molecules all the way through monoclonal antibodies. Its tunable particle size can be really driven by the process characteristics and we can target um, deep lung by using a dry powder inhaler. And finally, there are a small range, but there is a range of lung safe excipients that are compatible with spray drying, um, such as amino acids or mono and polysaccharides. So why is it? that spray drying is appropriate. Well, really it's, it's mild temperature exposure to begin with. Um, really the, the residence time in the drying chamber is less than 30 seconds. There's evaporative cooling in the process. So really the temperature of the product is never really higher than the evaporative, the, the temperature of the outlet of the product. And product exposure is very short. Um, drying times are very fast, milliseconds. And it, again, it's, we're able to optimize with drying conditions and atomization um, the powder and, you know, get to the right size. And finally, it's commercially viable. There's a number, I think, uh, in excess of 20 oral products now out uh, based on spray drying and, and a couple of inhaled products based on spray drying. And it's continuous and scalable. So inhaled form formulations are robust and respirable if you use L-leucine in your formulation. Um, L-leucine improves the, the spray dried particle aer aerosol properties and that's really because if you go through the, the uh, succession of the pictures, you start out with a liquid droplet. As that droplet dries, you exceed the solubility of leucine in the particle or in the droplet. And so the leucine effectively migrates to the surface of these droplets. And in the end, you have a crystalline coating on top of your amorphous powder um, uh, particles. And this is work that uh, has been described by Varing and his group uh, over the past decade or so. So an exemplary five A's of spray dried powder, uh, we chose a 10% drug loading, so 10% five A's uh, with 20% leucine, looking for that to crystallize and coat the surface in a trailose formulation. A trailose is chosen because it's a high TG 
lung safe excipient that stables, stabilizes the five A's at its high solubility amorphous form. Again, leucine is crystalline by powder X-ray and the trehalose five A's of phase is amorphous by uh, differential scanning calorimetry, TG uh, in the mid 50 degree range. And then finally, um, in vitro performance was measured for this formulation after spray drying by a next gener generation impaction. And we find an MMAD uh, on the order of three microns, so very nicely fitting into the one to five micron particle size range we were looking for. Fine par particle fraction is moderate at about 50%, but the emitted dose from the impactor um, is, is quite high at 90%. So a pretty good uh, aerosol performance uh, for in this, this formulation. So a picture of the dome, of course, beautiful building here in, in Edinburgh which leads me into next uh, phases, which is the, the uh, rodent PK and apparatus design. So this is how we demonstrated feasibility. The apparatus is uh, uh, basically the, the rodents, the rats are hooked into a, a single chamber, each with a separate port. And the uh, aerosol is generated either using a nebulizer in the case of a solution or a rotating brush to generate the aerosol in a, um, <clears throat> for a dry powder. And then the rats freely breathe. We can measure the concentration of the drug in the aerosol in the chamber, which allows us to, to calculate the dose that the, the rodents are being subjected to. And so to, um, to uh, go ahead and compare formulations, uh, we generated uh, five formulations, a systemic formulation, uh, which was two mg per kg, an aqueous aerosol, which we dosed at 0.6 mg per kg, and three dry powder aerosols based on the formulation I previously described at three doses, 0 0.3, 0 0.6, and 0 0.9 milligrams per kilogram. And so here are the uh, rat PK uh, results from the lung tissue. And you can see, as uh, I mentioned early in the talk, that the uh, concentration of the 5As uh, in the lung from systemic delivery is, is pretty low. Um, and dry powder and the aqueous solution that were uh, nebulized and you know, given to the rats um, performed about the same. Uh, you know, you can argue there's a little Twitter at the beginning where the dry powder is a little slower to dissolve and maybe it lasts a little longer in the lung due to the fact that it has to dissolve before uh, it, it's um, put into the tissue itself. If you just take a, a uh, straightforward look at the data, there's a 14 fold increase in the lung compared with the, the IP injection. However, if you uh, dose normalize properly, it's really a 50 fold increase in AUC in the lung. So let's look at the other tissues. Um, plasma is shown in the, the lower right or left-hand corner of the graph. Um, we see about a two and a half fold increase for the dry powder compared to the injectable drug. Um, not surprisingly, if the drug's in the plasma at a higher concentration, it also accumulates in the liver to a higher concentration. And we think this is uh, the dry powder effectively stabilizes the drug for a longer period of time, uh, preventing uh, degradation, which 5As it does readily degrade, um, from happening in the lung prior to entering into either the plasma or the liver. That's a little bit speculative, but that's possible. Uh, and then uh, with the brain data, it's also very interesting that uh, we see a, a substantially higher exposure for five days in the brain relative to the other two formulations. Um, we're not sure why this is, this is occurring. Uh, very unlikely to be due to a higher plasma exposure. Um, maybe, speculatively again, it's due to the fact that uh, this is a dry powder formulation. It's being administered to a nose breathing rodent. So there's some potential here for um, maybe some retention in the nose and the, the brain, blood, uh, drug crossing a blood brain barrier. But again, uh, completely speculative and, and worthy of, of further um, research. So another beautiful picture of Edinburgh, uh, the Royal Botanic Garden at night. Uh, again, quite beautiful. Uh, taking me on to the next topic of the efficacy study. So in the efficacy study, uh, nude rats were irradiated to suppress the immune system. Uh, they were then intratracheally instilled with human lung cancer cell lines. Um, as shown in the table at the bottom of, of this slide, four different cell lines were used as kind of the major types of, of uh, non-small cell lung carcinoma. 
um, a KLU-6, and KLU-3 representing adeno carcinoma, uh, H35-8 uh, in situ carcinoma, and the RH2 representing the squamous cell carcinoma. Um, so they were given uh, somewhere between seven and a half and 15 million cells, and then just allowed uh, to have the cancer grow as they had no treatment for three weeks. And then they were exposed to uh, treatment four consecutive days per week for four weeks of either the aqueous aerosol or the dry powder uh, spray dried um, uh, formulation. And you can see some pictures of some of the cell graphs uh, maturing in the right hand uh, micrographs. So uh, the, the punchline, I guess, is in the title, dry powder five days of formulations do reduce tumor burden. Um, the graph in the lower left is the tumor burden in grams. Uh, depending on whether um, they were administered air is the placebo um, uh, formulation, a, the aqueous formulation, or the dry powder formulation. And you can see at least in the KLU6, KLU3, and RH2 formulations, um, the dry powder outperforms the aqueous formulation, which of course outperforms um, no formulation at all. In the H30, five, eight, um, the dry powder and the uh, um, aqueous formulation seem to have very similar efficacy in terms of reducing tumor, tumor burden. So gonna take a step back now um, to demethylation and inhaled formulations and gene demethylation because that's the posited hypothesis for how this is going to work is that we're going to reverse the methylation of the DNA. And so if you look at the bar chart in the center, uh, we're now looking at number of genes demethylated um, at greater than 30% uh, as a function of the cell lines and the formulations. And you can see in each case um, with perhaps the exception of RH2, um, the dried powder was much more effective at demethylating the um, uh, DNA than the aqueous formulation. In the case of the RH2 um, uh, cell line, you can look at that and squint and say, well, maybe the dry powder is a little bit better, but uh, that's not one I would take to the bank. And then you can summarize these results in a nice set of Venn diagrams um, where if you see a, a green a piece of a green circle, that means that the aqueous formulations did the demethyl demethylation. If you see a dark purple, circle, that means the dry powder was responsible for the demethylation. And then the uh, light purple is the overlap between the two. And pretty much it looks like, with maybe again exception a little bit in the RH2, that any genes that the aqueous formulation was capable of demethylating, uh, the dry powder demethylated as well. And then the converse was not true. The dry powder was a defect, effective at, uh, of demethylating other genes as well. So since this is a Christmas lecture, I'll, I'll uh, take this slide um, to say Merry Christmas and to uh, and prosperous New Year, of course, and um, go on and talk about is this a generally applicable technique. So in a in a separate study, we looked at the general applicability of the approach, uh, looking at topotecan again, a drug that I said earlier in the talk was used for solid cancers, but um, suffers uh, dose limitations because of, of blood toxicity. And so again, just to summarize quickly, lung concentration on the Y axis in the left-hand graph versus time. And you can see an inhaled formulation, even at, at a much lower dose is more effective of getting into the lung tissue than an IV formulation of the same drug. And also tumor burden has been done on this uh, uh, drug as well. Again, plotting tumor burden on the y-axis versus uh, filtered air, topotecan two mg per kg IV and topotecan one mg per kg uh, inhaled dry powder. And of course, again, uh, you can see from the graph that the dry powder inhaled formulation was much more effective. So I'd like to just really summarize at this point um, and maybe take, give a couple of takeaway points. Five A's is a potent demethylation agent that it could be used in treating lung cancer. It um, has limit, limited chemical use due to poor distribution of the drug to the lung. Um, it can be delivered directly to the lung as we showed in the study using engineered spray dried particles. 
And the spray dried particles of 5As are delivered to the lung have improved PK, so higher tissue levels, and improved efficacy, so reduced tumor burden. And at first blush uh, with topotecan, um, it looks like this is platform is generalizable to other small molecules. Uh, we've done some work and some other indications looking at some peptides and small proteins and have some ongoing work looking at um, uh, MABs for delivery to the lung again for lung cancer. So uh, stay tuned and we hope to report back on that soon. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, David. Um, I think David is going to be available for um, live questions. Good morning. Good morning, David. Um, I, I'm, I'm currently in Edinburgh, uh, and I can assure you that um, although a lot of things are very different, that there is currently a whipping wind, a great <laughs> there's moisture in the air. <laughs> um, some questions for you. It's a fascinating talk. Um, one intriguing aspect is, is the the difference you found with with the liquid versus powder formulation, where they had similar concentrations in the lung, very different uh, systemic um, concentrations in, in other organs, uh, and different efficacy as well. Could could that be down to different regional deposition? It, it sure could be. Um, yeah, as, as I said when I spoke, that uh, any real explanation at this point is speculative. We don't necessarily have data that would say it's this or that. Uh, regional deposition for sure is a possibility. And the other uh, possibility is, is that 5As is um, notoriously unstable once it's in solution. And uh, in fact, you know, the maybe backstory to the whole spray drying piece is uh, that was an actual significant body of work is just finding something we could dissolve um, the excipients plus the 5As in that did not lead to degradation prior to spray drying. And so just I think the act potentially of just having a liquid available quickly in the lung for enzymes to go after the drug may also lead to just a, a lower efficacy, um, ultimately poor distribution. Okay, we have a, a, a few questions around, um, I, I guess, the, the translatability of, of, the, of, of the project. Um, questions about um, the, the extent to which uh, the, the methylation is, is the main mechanism of, uh, of, of cancer in the lungs and, and the time frame over which the, the, the metastatic disease uh, begins to uh, occur. Uh, uh, and I guess related to that, we've got other questions about the envisaged dose frequency uh, in a clinical scenario. Yeah, I'm, that, that's a, I think we're so early on in the project in terms of just showing efficacy at all that um, optimizing a dosing regimen or even thinking about translating to people is just very early. And I, I think I'm, I'm pretty pleased at this point, we've shown that we can um, reduce tumor burden in a rodent model and, um, and show that there's some correlatability to the epigenetics and the, so the methylation, demethylation of, of the DNA. But uh, yeah, it, to speculate past that, you know, we're, we're really way too early in the, in the program to, to think about that. Okay, so... To, to clarify on that one, um, you, you, you're, I, I guess the question is, how early in, in the disease do you think you'd have to give the first dose, for example? Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I think that uh, without question, you want to be in that window where you have identified lung cancer preferably earlier is better once the cancer is identified. And obviously once um, metastasis has occurred, um, delivery direct to the lung you know, is gonna have to be in combination with uh, radiation or in combination with 
some other chemotherapeutic method to take care of what's actually migrated out of the lung. So I, I think there's probably a window, a narrow window in which lung cancer has been identified that direct delivery to the lung is going to be efficacious. Does that help? I, I guess that's the that, that, that's the position in the project where you're at. Um, and a, a final question is around the safety. Um, did, did you observe any damage to, to mucous membranes or any other signs of adversity in, in the lung studies? No. Um, you know, as, as the uh, tumor burden was measured and the lungs were um, taken apart, uh, we did not observe anything that appeared to have a negative impact of either the aqueous formulation or the dry powder formulation. Um, the excipients chosen were chosen because they've been used at least in prior preclinical and clinical pro programs, if not a commercial product. So, and uh, no early signs of tox. Uh, of course, ultimately, you know, that has to be borne out in longer term toxicology studies. Okay, uh, good luck with the project and, and, and thank you very much for getting up uh, early in the morning to take our questions. Very happy to do so and I wish you well in Edinburgh. Thank you.